instinct is best in behavior or speculation. You know, so, so a lot of people will say, gee, I wish we were back in the age of uh, J.P. Morgan. At least we got the creation of productive capacities. Mm -hmm. you know, U.S. Steel, International Harvester. Um, and, you know, all we have now is investment in these uh, debt packages, basically. You know, pieces of staples, staples together. Debt uh, pay, papers, um, but with what's interesting about both eras, even in, in the age of J.P. Morgan, it's still speculation, and you get the same kind of crisis in that, as you refer to, is that some and often called the accumulation crisis is there's not you don't know what to invest in, and sometimes there's too much to invest in. So what was done in the past was you'd be able to speculate with too many railroads. You know, and hope that you get the, the, the quick return you know, on this one of the speculation of the railroads and praying that the railroad doesn't even open, but you've made your paper return. So what's, there's no difference between an old age of investment and a new age of investment in terms of the speculative nature of it. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've just got a different product rather than uh, the, the bond that could create a capital capacity like the steel. Um, and this makes me wonder about what is happening in the 1950s and 60s, and I think this could be some great research if we can get into internal memoranda, about the decision making not to remodernize a plant in the face of e extraordinary knowledge about the deterioration of that plant, in the face of the extraordinary knowledge about new technologies like the basic oxygen harvester. Mm -hmm to which there could be greater productive capacity, mm -hmm. to which our emerging competitors ultimately are taking our patents and investing mm -hmm. in, or in the lighter cars and the gas you know, efficient cars and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it is a very kind of peculiar uh, accumulation crisis where it, it's, we're gonna shift from an investment that creates a, a tangible capital good to putting your money into some often extremely complicated financial instrument, which is pack the packaging of, of debt. And that to me is kind of a really interesting empirical question, which you know, I can see a generation of historians working at on um, steel, auto, electric. Um, why the decision like GE uh, to, to begin to say, we've got this excess surplus funds, uh, rather than pouring it into um, uh, new, new tech uh, innovation and capacities uh, to begin to pour it into these dead instruments and, and speculate on these dead instruments. It is a classic accumulation crisis, you know, a Marxist accumulation crisis. Oh, we don't use that word anymore. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> so that to me would be, there's an empirical question if we can get into the heads of these people or into the memorandums of these people, why they shift there. And I, my suspicion is, is that um, the, the memory of overcapacity and building capacities that uh, outran effective demand, which was sort of their memories of the Great Depression, um, was still functioning there. And in fact, they may have been interpreted that there were saturated markets here. And what good is it to produce more cars when you're, you may not get the return on the production of those cars? So one of the elements to me, which I would add to you, an element in, and I've read both of your books, that you touch on, but I think needs to be examined more, is this kind of, um, this, this, moment of accumulation crisis we've had them before in, in speculative menus where there is conscious decisions not to modernize the plant and giving us the rust belted world you know yeah. that we live in. Uh, well I, I think I think this is an excellent question and certainly something that I am thinking about right now. So let me first of all let me tell you that, so my next book that I'm working on is a book called Short Sighted. It's about the sort of restructuring of corporations in the 60s, 70s, and uh, in the post-war to today, and looking at how we go from um, the fashioning of permanent corporations with retained earnings 
and long-term investments in R&D and all those things and permanent jobs for employees to a more flexible kind of accumulation, which you know, David Harvey et al. Have, have done a lot of hand-waving at, but how you actually look at the business records and make sense of it, um, there hasn't been anything done, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And I think, so uh, give me a couple of years, and maybe I'll have a better answer for you. Uh, yeah, I think it's a big question. There's lots of room on it. Um, so, you know, and for me, it's, it's, it's understanding the relationship of labor and capital investment and government policy. So eventually the books will become more and more boring as the older I get, because they'll just be the same questions over and over again. Um, but I think this is a set for me. Um, so the class I teach, one of the classes I teach is Intro to Labor History um, at at Cornell, and I teach a lot on this, this exact thing you're talking about, the steel industry, which I think is so fascinating. You know, why in the face of, we have all these open hearth plants, right? These older kinds of plants that are not modernized. You have the basic oxygen furnace, the electric furnace, um, which for those who aren't interested in the history of steel, um, are just very efficient kinds of new kinds of steel, productive ways to make steel that um, are much faster, they're cleaner, they run off electricity and not coal, and so there's lots of reasons. And during the 1960s, as Japan is rebuilding, they only install basic oxygen furnaces. They install all these new kinds of electric furnaces, and eventually it portends the emergence of the flexible steel regime that we're in now, where they're made by mini mills. This is an accord, what you're saying. So the question is, why do we not do this? And I think there's, there's uh, a couple answers to it. One. One of the big differences, of course, by the middle of the 20th century from the late 19th century is that the owners no longer run things, right? So you have the emergence of management as a force in and of itself within corporations. Um, and managers are, and I can tell you this from my consulting days, managers are not as uh, big picture oriented as perhaps magnates like JP Morgan would be. So the speculation is still there but as Galbraith wrote, you know, in the new industrial state, by the post-war period, they're less concerned about profit maximization, right? Or if you read Peter Drucker, right, writing his first book in 1954, if you read Peter Drucker, the purpose of business is not to maximize profits. Right? There's many different reasons why we, why we have a business enterprise. Profit is a constraint on our activities rather than the goal of our activities. This is Peter Drucker. This is not a guy you think of as you know, a radical socialist, right? This is the go-to guy for management for, for 40 years. Yet this is how he's describing the post-war corporation. Um, and so when you look at this, and there's actually been, I forget the name of it escapes me right now. There's a history of Bethlehem Steel. Does anyone remember the name of this book? There's a history of Bethlehem Steel where um, they talk about this. Uh, the author talks about this, um, talking about why Bethlehem Steel in the 50s had this offshore bank they had an offshore bank in like Nassau where they would move, make sure all their capital from when they bought ore in South America and they would do this elaborate shenanigans so that when the ore was let, out, uh, let off the boat at Baltimore where it could be used for the Bethlehem steel plant, somehow the accounting would never work out and they kept all the money that they earned offshore. And they were so psyched about this. They made millions of dollars and um, like hundreds of millions of dollars, they started to set up their own banks offshore in a way that it could be almost like uh, Romney, you know, in his heyday, doing this kind of thing. And yet, what happened was there was a shift in power, Bethlehem Steel in the late 1950s, um, and it all got shut down. It all got shut down because the people in charge of Bethlehem Steel in the 1950s didn't believe in finance. They didn't believe in this. This is not what killed the Nazis. What beat the Nazis was steel. What beat the Nazis were tanks. What beat the Nazis were ships, not clever finance. Now, why did they think this? There's a couple, and this is where it gets into the cultural. First of all, um, why are they not interested in finance? That's what Jews do. Right? If you look at the records of the Harvard Business School in the post-war period, you can see that Jews go into finance and real Americans go into production. All right? So there's this rampant anti-Semitism in the post-war period. Now, in terms of imagining emerging markets, it's hard for Americans, these managers, to imagine car companies, to imagine the, Jap the Japanese auto market, which they had 98% of, right, until suddenly they didn't, right, with the Corolla, that until suddenly they didn't, um, would ever amount to anything from 
compared to the US, right? They had just beaten them down, they're in charge. So there, there is this cultural legacy. Um, there is a certain sort of um, ethnocentrism, racism, all the stuff historians like to talk about. <laughs> Sitting pretty, you know, we beat them. We don't need to modernize. But there's also the economics of plant modernization too, right? Because as soon as you modernize, all your other plants are worthless. It's the time cycle of plant modernization, right? And you have that with U.S. Steel at the turn of the century as well, right? U.S. Steel had this massive overcapacity in all this plant that the way they dealt with it was through Pittsburgh Plus, right? By manipulating pricing regimes so that their plants would have um, be able to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, so th there's a real um, hesitancy among a managerial class to improve what they have, right? They know how this stuff works. They don't want cutting edge things. They know the guy, Bob, who's in charge of this plant, doesn't want to shut down his plant and fire all people. So it's the internal inertia and structure of corporations, I think, um, in the post-war that leads to many of these decisions that in, in a lot of ways lead to um, um, bad outcomes for the future growth of the American economy. But at the same time, you have huge monopolies um, like AT&T that allow for things like Bell Lab, like that good book uh, that just came out, The Innovation Factory. You know, looking at the ways in which we did enable certain kinds of technologies that we're still living off today, right? Like there's been no fundamental breakthrough in science uh, for what, 50 years, right? I mean, that. Like our cell phones, our 1960s technology, our internet 60s technology, the space shuttle, which doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, basically nothing we live in uh, is new. Um, and cell phones and uh, Google don't really employ anybody. And they certainly don't, not types of investment for capital, right? Um, so it, it's, it's something that is, uh, I'm going on just as long as you did, so that you know, historians can rant. We're good at ranting, right? Um, Anyway, but I, yeah, I think this is an essential problem. Hopefully, historians that are not uh, trained by Chandler will begin to see that um, the, the lean, fir lean firm is not an aberration, but an actual something akin to that of Sloan in the 1920s and the M form corporation. And part of it's that historiographic, that you just have a generation of people who are trained by Chandler. God bless him, he was a great historian, but has constrained the way we think about corporate organization. Also, people just don't want to write about corporations. They want to write about you know, the revolutionaries, things like that. So.